So everybody's very welcome um, to this GCMA webinar, um, which is the essential skills for future club managers. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by Amy Yates, who is CEO of Murpar Golf Club in Hertfordshire. Uh, Amy has a, a fantastic career progression behind her already, uh, which she, she will elaborate on a little bit later. Um, but yeah, it's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to hear what Amy has to say you know, on, on leadership, on culture change within organizations and within golf clubs in particular. Um, yeah, and and taking, taking that knowledge forward um, to your own jobs and how that can help you with your own careers and, and moving forward. So just before um, we, we get on to Amy, and I will be giving her a thumbs up shortly, um, We'll have a quick look at a little bit about ourselves, about the GCMA, for those of you who don't know us and um, who are just joining us for the first time. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, oh dear. And hopefully I will um, have a, a presentation for you somewhere. If you just bear with me a second. I do apologize for the, the mix-ups this morning. Uh, as Amy said, everything was working perfectly uh, until the very last moment. Um, yeah, so, so basically what it is, it's just to, just to have a, a brief talk to you about the GCMA, who we are and what we do. Um, I can't actually find that presentation now, which is mm. uh, unfortunate. So, um, so basically, the GCMA was formed um, back in 1932, I do believe, which makes us uh, 88 years old. So uh, we have a we have a lot of history and heritage behind us. Um, basically, it was set up as the Association of, uh, of Golf Club Secretaries, which was the the original name of the role. Um, and from that, it progressed uh, through time, gathered momentum. Um, and really fulfilling the, the needs of those secretaries uh, and managers as they came online a little bit later. There was a major change in 2007 when the association changed its name to the, the Golf Club Managers Association, highlighting the, the, the new requirements of the role um, and the increasing status of the role within the golf club. Uh, not so much a um, servant of the club, but, but more a, a professional working within the club and, and leading the club forward. So that's really where the potential of the, the association lies. Its, its strength lies in its membership. Uh, we have a membership of over uh, 1,500. Um, the, the role of, of golf club manager itself uh, can be uh, a lonely role. Uh, there's, there's no other golf club manager in your club to talk to about things. So um, you, know, you often find yourself um, seeking advice from other golf club managers. So that's really the, the strength of our association is in that networking uh, between golf club managers, bringing them together, giving them events, uh, helping them with, with professional development as, as we're doing today. Um, and, you know, and, and making sure that you know, they're, they're at the leading edge of, uh, of the industry, of knowledge and, and the skills that they need going forward you know, to make a success of golf clubs. Because at the end of the day, what we're actually trying to do um, is, is to have more golfers uh, and the better, the better the golf club is run and um, then, you know, the more attractive proposition it comes to people to come and join the club. So that's really what we're about. And um, we love what we do. Uh, any, any golf club general manager will tell you hopefully that it's, it's a very, very high pressure job and uh, normally quite long hours, but also a very, very rewarding job. Um, and that's why we do it because we love it. So, um, just one final mention before I hand over to Amy. Um, we have a Principles of Golf Club Management course coming up in October. Um, it will be done via Zoom, hopefully with um, a little bit more smoothness than today um, with, with time to prepare for it. We have already done one course, so, and it was extremely successful uh, with, with 15 delegates on that course, and they, they found it extremely worthwhile. We have some great testimonials from them. And they, they got their certificate leaving that course. So that's the, the principles of golf club management via Zoom, uh, October the 12th to the 16th. Uh, it'll be roughly three to four hours per day. Um, 
normally morning sessions, hopefully from 9.30 to 1.30 would be the, the target, uh, but that could be changed. Um, so anybody who's interested in that course, uh, please drop me a line, gavin at gcma.org.uk. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Amy. Could I just ask everyone to, to at that point, to, to turn their cameras off um, and their microphones so as, uh, so as we get the best possible um, opportunity for, for Amy. Okay, thank you very much. There will be a Q&A afterwards. By all means, put your questions in the chat box uh, below. Amy already has some questions which have been sent through through the registration process. So if we have time, we'll get through to all of those as well. So I'll now hand you over to Amy. I just, I think I've just got really good at lip reading, Gavin, because I, I think <laughs> at some point in there you said I'm going to hand over to Amy. Very yes. good, yeah, that's, that's right. Impressive. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully that will work. Very strange. I'm going to hopefully you can see that. There you go. Okay, so if anyone has any problems during this presentation, um, please write on the group chat. I think everybody's muted. This is the first time I have delivered uh, this seminar via Zoom, and particularly now I, I can't hear Gavin. Um, I'm just in silence, so uh, a very strange way to deliver a seminar, but hey ho. Um, Gavin, I can see your video, so um, just wave at me frantically if someone's asked a question or, or, inter or wants to interact because um, that's what we ideally want today. So welcome everybody. Um, I think as Gavin has said, um, we are wanting to do these seminars and just try and have them free, interactive. Ideally, we want people talking to each other and networking with each other. So keep an eye on the names that are on the screen and maybe have a little think if you do recognize them or not. Um, feel free to um, you know, communicate with each other afterwards because it's, it's great that you're on this, uh, this sort of session. So um, when it comes to, oh, I just had a little button thing, chat. Okay, cool, hang on, let me just click the chat. I don't know if anyone's chatted yet. So um, when it comes to uh, presenting, um, I'm very honored that any of you would actually even come and listen to what I've got to say. Uh, I'd like to think I'm a relatively humble person. I am not perfect by any means, and I've got a long way to go with a huge amount of learning. But today I'm just gonna try and give you some tidbits and thoughts that are important to me and how I try and live my life and also uh, try and run run the business and run the club. So um, I'm going to try not to go too heavy. 90% um, of it you probably will go in and out, but hopefully there'll be 10% that you'll go, yeah, I get that. It resonates with me and I'm going to try and implement that uh, in the club or business that you're in at the moment. So um, without further ado, I'll click to the next slide. So today we're just going to cover these um, big topics, but in small little slices. So the importance of knowing your why, anyone who's read uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why, that's, I hugely recommend it, but we're gonna talk in brief about that. Once you know your why, how to test it through uh, what we call the celery test, how to change a culture, which is um, really important when it comes to leadership, um, career progression, and then Q&A. Thank you to everybody. You've, you've written in quite a long list of questions for me. So that, that might be a big chunk as well of uh, the session, which I think is really useful. So let's, let's get into it. So in terms of leadership then, my, my thoughts are that great leadership, you can only really start to be a really great leader when you, as a person, and your club know that your why. So if anyone, I've got my books here, but anyone who hasn't read it, need to go onto Amazon and order this book. It's called Start With Why from, by Simon Sinek. He's done like three or four now, but definitely go onto Amazon and order that. And it's actually quite a thin read, so it shouldn't take you too long to get through it. But the basic principle of it is the golden circle. So Simon's created this um, idea of, of a golden circle. So in the middle of it, you've got the why, then outside you've got the how, and then outside that, the what. So the what is something that we, we all know. So every organization, everyone knows what they do. So it's the sort of the products that they sell, or for us as an individual, it's that question when you're at a networking event and someone says, oh, so what do you do? 
and you turn around and say, oh, I'm the chief executive of Moore Park, or oh, I'm the golf club manager here, or I'm the operations manager there. It's what you actually do, but it's not how you do it, or it's not why you do it. So for us as a business, um, it would be the equivalent of us saying, uh, I've got 36 holes of golf, um, I have a clubhouse, um, I've got a bar, uh, I offer food and I offer drink. It's, it's the what we do. And most organizations know that and most organizations market themselves with that as well, the majority. The next level is how. Now, we've started over through the 90s and the early 2000s, we started to talk about things like USPs and you saw websites of clubs starting to put things like, um, oh, we've got a championship golf course or we've got the best bacon roll in town or we have a grade one listed building or we've got an amazing um, outside space. So it's more about sort of the things that make them special. So these are the things that we talk about often. And we have actually got used to in our industry differentiating ourselves using the how between each other. So you'll know other clubs, other courses that are around you, your neighbours. You've probably sat in board meetings where the chairman says, well, how are we going to be different? How are we going to be better then? You know, how, what are we going to do differently to them? We're very much in the how area, which is fine. And, it, and, it's, and it's good. It's much better than defining yourself by what you do. So it is a step in the right direction. But the middle one is the one where we really need to understand. And that's, and that's the why. So very few people, very few organizations can clearly articulate what, uh, sorry, why they actually do it. So what, what is their purpose as a club? What is your purpose as a person in life? Um, what, why do you get out of bed in the morning? You know, it's quite a profound question, but you should know the answer to that. Um, why does your club exist? You know, is it to drive to junior membership and young membership? Is it to become, um, you know, the sort of the retirement home of the area where actually you're going to be the best of the best for, for over 60s? Um, and once you've answered that question, why does, why does it matter to anyone else what, what, you've, what you've picked? Um, it's important to say as well, making money is not a why. Um, the revenues, profits, salaries, any other monetary measurement, um, they're simply results of, of, of why you're doing things. It's not the reason why you should get out of bed in the morning is to make money or to make profits. And this is a really hard one because your board or your proprietary owners, they are usually focused on the success of the business financially. What's our cash flow? What's our KPIs? You know, have we got enough money to invest? And that, that, comes a lot of your conversation in board meetings but actually it's it's not where you should start you as a club and as a person should really try and drill down to what what is your contribution as a club what how, how do you impact others how do you serve others and it should in, it should inspire you it shouldn't be oh, i've got the best bacon roll it should it should be something uh, quite profound so to put this into practice, I've, I've written a few examples of companies uh, that, that have good examples. So Apple, right? So their, their why, and, and this is on their website and things like that, you can find it, is everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. Now, what's quite interesting is if you put your hand over the word Apple, and read that sentence again, everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo, we believe in thinking differently, you wouldn't necessarily guess it was Apple. It could, it could be any company, any kind of industry. It doesn't say anything about technology, uh, phones, computers, laptops, tablets. Um, but if someone then said, that's Apple's statement, you look at it and go, yeah, I get that, because they live to that every day. They are constantly trying to challenge the status quo. They're constantly trying to think, do things differently. The next one is, a, is an American airline, Southwest Airlines. And they, they say that they're a budget sort of airline. So their statement is, we are the champion for the common man. Again, you wouldn't read that and think that that was an airline. You, you, you wouldn't know what that was, but what you would gain from that is that they are a company who are looking to be accessible um, but for the normal person, you know, so they're not high end. That's what that definitely says to you. IKEA, 
to create a better everyday life for the many. That makes sense to me because, you know, I go to Ikea, it's affordable. Um, you can usually get out a house in one foul swoop. Um, it, it makes sense that, that that is Ikea's statement. But by reading it, you wouldn't necessarily know that it's a, a furniture, a Swedish furniture company. And the last one here is Colgate. Uh, and this one was, was quite interesting for me because it's look for ways to help people feel more confident. That's not a toothpaste, toothbrush company, is it? That's, you know, but actually when you think about it, yeah, that is what they're doing. Because if you have clean teeth, you have a whiter smile or whatever, um, then you are probably going to feel a bit more confident. And that's what they are trying to do. So that's, that's their why. And it's, it's, some might say it's fluffy, but actually that's where things should start. So you should start with the why in the middle. And that's what you should focus on first. And then once you've figured out your why, you then go to the how and then you go to the what. Too many times people go, well, what are we? And then how are we going to deliver that? And oh, what's our why? So they go in the wrong way. So you should need to start with the why and spread out. So this is a really interesting one in terms of revenues. So Harley Davidson. So this chap here, the, the brand of Harley Davidson is it started off as being a motorbike company. They made motorbikes. 12% of their revenue comes from merchandising. So their, their logo no longer identifies the company by its products, but it identifies it by its beliefs, what it stands for. This chap has felt so strongly about the brand that he's put it on the back of his head because when he walks around and people see him with that, it says something about him because he then says, well, let's think about it. You know, I'm a bit rough and tough. I'm, I'm hard. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Harley Davidson driver. Don't mess with me. You know, I'm a bit rock and roll. And that's my, that's my perception of what Harley Davidson is. And so when I see him, that's what I now associate with him because he's got that brand on the back of his head. But it doesn't say that he probably doesn't even own, a, you know, a motorcycle. We know 12% of the revenue actually comes from merchandising. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing. So once, you, once you've got your why, and we are rattling through this quite quickly, but once you do have your why, it's, it's really important to test it. Um, so if I just, um, I think I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to get my YouTube. Oh, no, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Right, so I'm going to play you. I'm going to play you. Let's go back to this. I'm going to share again. I'm going to play you an advert. From let's go to here. I'm going to play you an advert from 1984, and some of you will probably see in the top corner where it's from. But while you watch this advert, I want you to think about what we've sort of just rushed through. But I want you to think about why you're watching this advert back in 1984. At what point when you watch it? Do you feel like you know what they're trying to sell you? Um, because that's, that's the real take home for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it and hopefully you can hear the other one. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives we have created for the first time in all history. A garden of pure ideology where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of being contradictory. computer will introduce Macintosh and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984 okay I'm just gonna go back to the PowerPoint did the volume work with that guys yeah okay good that's great um, so let's just get back to oh I find a funny feeling I'm still playing am I still playing yeah <laughs> okay hang on all right Okay, 
All right, so, uh, and everyone can still hear me and my sound's okay. Okay, good, thanks Gavin for the thumbs up. So what, what I found was quite interesting was that at Apple in 1984, before we even these books came out, they did an advert that, that knowing their why about challenging the status quo and doing things differently, can you imagine what that advert must have looked like 36 years ago to a lot of people? Because that's not how people market it. Um, but, but yet it matches their why. So even their advertising campaigns, everything they did, they looked back to their why and said, by doing this advert, are we challenging the status quo? Yes. Are we doing things differently? Yes. But what for me was the most important bit was throughout the whole advert, you had no idea what they were actually trying to sell you, but you knew it was a bit different. And the, the, the crazy 80s lady running in with her short, shorts and vest top is just what's going on, but she's, she was the one that was challenging the status quo. And even back in 1984, when they were sat in the crowd, you know, that it was like Apple saying, look guys, you're all these people in the crowd, just going about your day every day. We can offer something different. We can challenge the status quo. Come along with us, be, be part of our journey. Don't be part of the normal journey that HP and, and Microsoft and Dell were doing at the time. So, everything they did matched to, to their why. Um, so I'm just looking at the group chat now, just quickly. Uh, uh, so Sam said, yeah, I would have thought Apple's is, is more than a how. Yeah, potentially. Um, but, but I think what makes it right for Apple is it's about what, what is important to Apple. And I think that's what your why needs to be. What, what is the most important thing to your club? And for Apple, it's about challenging the status quo and it's about being differently different and you can see that in in since they've they've been created um gavin you're on presented you can't see your powerpoint yeah no it's fine it's because i'm going into another video now so so as a summary then really important to have your why really 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 important to have your why and you might spend hours thinking about it when i first started at moore park we sat down um, and we, we talked through all of the things and we got a list of about 200 words, descriptive words, and we thought, okay, what, what do we want to be? Do we want to be uh, exclusive? Oh, no, I don't like that word. Do we want to have status? Do we want to be luxury? Go through all the words and think, what is the one that really resonates with you as a, as a club? Um, so, so our one is to en enrich members' lives through an exceptional club experience. Now, it does, if you were to read that, unlike the other companies, you, you would get from it that it's a club experience and it is a member's experience. And we did talk for hours about whether to put those two words in there. But for us, it was very important to, to focus on that. So uh, we, are, we, are, we are there to enrich members' lives, big one to the first one. So we want members to feel like they are happier because they're a member in their life with more part than they would be if they weren't a member with more part. And then the next one is exceptional club experience. But it doesn't say anything about golf, it doesn't say anything about tennis, it doesn't say anything about the, the, the mansion, but it is just that experience that people uh, have when they come to the club, and that, that, is, that is our, our why. So I urge you all to, to read the book, to sit down with your teams, and actually just ask the question, why are we here, guys? What's, what's the point? But, you know, are we, are we here to, to do juniors? Are we here to do older people? Are we here to be a great golf course? Are we here to be, do a really good food and beverage experience? Because the tough thing about it, as we all know, is you can't be everything to everyone. So define yourself, understand what you are, and then go hell for leather at it. So once you have your why, the, the next video I'm going to show you is what's called the celery test. And it's really important and you get to stop listening uh, to me and for four minutes you get to listen to Simon Sinek who is a better presenter than I am. So I'm going to share the screen and click on that one and hopefully. So Gavin just give me a thumbs up when the sound starts working. Now it's time to put your why into action. Discovering your why is just the beginning. In order to enjoy all the benefits of having a clearly articulated why, you'll need to have the courage and discipline to use it. Like Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is hallucination. There is an ideal order for implementing your why, though sometimes reality does get in the way, and it all starts with you. Our natural tendency is to start with the tangible, 
We define our value by what we do. So it takes practice to start with why. Like riding a bicycle, at first we're unsure, unsteady. We're in our heads thinking about all the things we need to do. Pedal fast, keep enough speed so we don't fall over. We have to really concentrate. We may even fall over, even scrape our knees. But we get back on the bike and try again. And eventually, it becomes natural. Starting with why is no different. At first, it feels awkward. It may not even work. But with practice, it will become so natural that you won't even be able to imagine a time when you couldn't do it, just like riding a bicycle. In time, your why will act as a filter for many of the decisions and choices you make. It becomes a tool to help you find a job or seize an opportunity in which you're more likely to succeed. It removes a lot of the guessing. Here's a metaphor to show you what I mean. It's called the celery test. We're constantly asking people for their advice on what to do or how to do it. It's like going to a dinner party and somebody says, do you know what you need? You need M&Ms. We've done so well with M&Ms, you've got to use M&Ms. Somebody else says to us, rice milk. In this economy, you have to use rice milk. Someone else says to us, Kit Kats. You have to use Kit Kats. And somebody else says to you, it's all about celery. We go to the supermarket with all this good advice from all these smart people with brilliant case studies, and we buy everything. We buy Kit Kats and M&Ms, celery and rice milk. There's a lot of time we spend at the supermarket and a lot of money we spend at the supermarket. And when we get to the checkout lane, we're standing there with all these products in our hands, and no one can see what we believe, because we bought everything. But let's imagine we know our why. Let's imagine our why is to always be healthy and only do things that protect the health of our bodies. Now, which products do we buy? Given all the same advice from all the same smart people, this time we only buy celery and we only buy rice milk. They're the only two that make sense. We spend less time and less money at the supermarket, and when we're standing there in line with only celery and only rice milk, now people can see what we believe. Somebody walking past can say, hey, I can see that you're healthy, so am I. You just attracted an opportunity or a referral or a friend simply by saying and doing the things that you believe. And the best part is it's scalable. As soon as I said the why, you knew exactly which products we were going to buy. This means the more you can articulate your why, the more others will know what you stand for and will be able to help you make the right decisions. From now on, you will work to ensure everything you do is a good fit. If you do too many things that aren't a good fit, you will feel uncomfortable and people will feel that you're being inauthentic. On the other hand, when you start with why, your ability to stand out, find support, and work to all your natural strengths will flourish. With practice, you will learn to trust your why. You will eventually start to see your job and the things you do as ways to breathe life into your cause. And the better you get at it, the more you will feel that your life and everything you do has purpose. The best way to implement your why is to work at it slowly. You don't have to do all the tips we suggest. What is important is that you pick up to three and commit to practicing and using them now. All right. Thank you, Simon. All right, pop that off, come back to here. Okay, great. So the, the next activity, if you can look at the group chat, I just, I want you to have a little think about that video that you've just watched and maybe just write something that you found interesting of what Simon said. Just not all of you have to do it, but just trying to get a bit of two way street here so I can have a little bit of a chat with you guys. Um, there's maybe a couple of you just type in something that you found interesting about what he was saying. Don't have to get into. I think Gavin's typing. Save on resources, absolutely. Particularly now, right? Because there's so many uh, pressures on what we're spending. Yeah, definitely. But there's so much pressure on what we're spending. And that whole supermarket analogy of going in and being like, ah, I need to try everything. I need to go and do this. I need to go and do that. I need to go and put, need to work with golf now. I need to work with two off times. I need to put something in golf club golfer. I need to go and do this. I need to, I need, I need to do social media and I need to do everything. And we all go to the board and the chairman and the proprietary clubs and goes, look at everything I've done. Isn't this great? I've made a big list of everything. I can't believe it's not working. Um, and nine times out of 10, it's because you're just saying too many different things to too many different marketplaces and everyone's just going, 
oh, okay, apart from brand recognition, because you've used the same hero shot in every single advert, it's not really doing much for you. Whereas what he's saying is, you know, go to that supermarket and particularly with a members club. Oh my word. You know, you get, you get it every day. You get 10 people coming up to you and going, well, what you should do, Amy, is, is this. And what you should have behind the bar is that. And the greens are this, but you should do this. You know, and you come back up to your office and listen, I said at the start, I'm not perfect. You come back up to your office and you start writing the things down. You're going, right, I must do that. And I must do that. I must do that. But you look at it and you think, wow, I'm just being reactive. I'm being reactive to every single person that speaks to me rather than what Simon's saying is, you know, right, think about why you're doing this. And if their suggestion, you put it back to your why and you go, yeah, is their suggestion going to enrich members' lives? Is their suggestion going to make my club experience better? Then I'm going to do it. It's a tick in the box. But if they're saying something that you just think, actually that's going to take us backwards or it's going to make us more unwelcoming then you just throw it out straight away so that's that's really good um gives you a clear direction that's just what we said committing to actions absolutely um drifting carol great great even word using that drifting and hopefully if anything this this 45 minute chat will when you say leave meeting at the end of it just maybe even write that word down do not drift because we all do it and, and we all are going to do it. But if again, write down your why, stay true to yourself, stay true to your club, it's definitely. Um, focus on your relevant fundamental purpose, provides clear direction. You guys have got it really good, absolutely nailed it. Um, it does make you stop and think, and it should make you stop and think. Clear plan, align products. Yeah, absolutely. You don't, you, you, I'm preaching to the converted already, which is really good. So let me go back to the presentation. And carry on. Oh, no, wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> We're not there yet. Share screen. It's the PowerPoint I want. There we go. Okay, so that was that. And we've done salary test. Okay, so this is a little poster that you find on Simon Sinek's uh, website, but it basically just talks about what great leaders do. So great leaders inspire action, and it goes back to that why again. So if you know what your why is, you can start talking to your employees about actually, it should be something that resonates with you and that you're excited about. If you're excited, you're generally happier, you've got a bit more energy, you're walking around the club, employees might think you're a bit mad, mine do, but actually they get some energy from you. Um, create a circle of safety. By knowing your why, you've created your own little bubble and you can stay within it. And, and yes, people are going to try and hammer in onto your bubble and they're going to try and change it. But if you stay resolute to it, you'll be successful. Um, tell the truth without doubt. Be honest. Um, lead the people, not the numbers. We've, we've made a reference to that already. Um, people are always going to try and suck you back into finances. And, uh, but you can change it, change the, the, the way that the industry works. Um, You'll, you'll hear it when you go to networking events and people go, oh, how are you getting on at Moor Park? And you just go straight into the numbers, right? Because it's just easier to do. Oh, yeah, we're 20% up on whatever. Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot better year on year than this, that and the other. Well, why don't you change that wording? Just start talking about your people. Actually, yeah, I've promoted so-and-so or I've got a really good assistant manager who's, who's doing a great job who I'm thinking about promoting. Um, and then this last one refers to a book uh, by Simon Sinek about leaders eating last. Um, start with why first and then, and then maybe go on to that one. But it's, it's, it's talking about this um, servant leadership style. So the, the, the smallest analogy would be staff lunch. You know, don't, don't be the general manager that always orders up the food from the, from the thing and you make your staff come up the stairs and, and give it to you. Um, be the one that, that if lunch is served at 12 o'clock, you know, you go down there and you put yourself at the back of the queue um, because your, your staff should come first and you should choose to eat last. OK, it's this is just something to, to, to read through. It's just basically the difference between managing, which we're all good at and, and leading, which sets us apart. So we, we all know what a manager does, but a leader we talked about it a lot already, but they inspire, they influence others through their own behavior. So it's do as I do. Um, they drive strategy, that whole vision, the why. 
they're the ones that are brave enough to say actually chairman or actually owner we need to be doing this and this is why we need to do it um, they have authority but in a nice way and they know the balance between it they're seen as a role model and they generally they generate enthusiasm so you shouldn't be grumpy and if you are grumpy shut the door in your office so people don't see it um, so my this is just my own personal take on my experience so be curious ask questions you can never ask enough questions um, i've made the mistake numerous times and i still make it now depending on what mood i'm in where sometimes you see something you either jump to a conclusion or you tell somebody what to do and you feel crap afterwards because you're like actually um, i didn't think uh, i wasn't curious enough i didn't ask enough questions of what they were going through what they were experiencing i didn't get enough all, all the information um, it's okay to show weakness big big thing in our industry um, and I, I do find sorry men and this is probably my only female comment of the day but I do find that women tend to uh, be be happier about showing weakness than men um, I don't know why but just what I just what I, what I sense um, but it is really important uh, particularly now with the whole mental well-being and everything your your staff are definitely going to be going through stuff um, and to see you struggling sometimes and for you to be open and honest about how you're feeling, um, keep it professional and, and obviously keep it as light as you can, but it's, it's important. And it's also important to be like, oh, I got it wrong guys, I should have listened to you. Um, bring yourself back to the reason you started, the reason you started this industry or the reason that your club started on the journey. And that's that whole why again, give praise and recognition Again, it's going back to that being curious, asking questions, giving praise, giving recognition, saying thank you, being genuine for why you're saying thank you. I think too many of us say thank you just generically. Um, I mean, it, you know, it's just a, a common signature picker now, isn't it? Kind regards or thank you so much, whatever. But why you thank you? That means a big difference when you actually say to people, Thank you for doing that because you brought that bacon roll out really quickly or you did that better or do you know what you worked really hard out there you, the speed of which you worked was really good give them a reason for why you're thank you um deal with problems when you see them again one of my weaknesses is um you walk in on on a day you've got a busy day ahead of you you've got a lot of work you've got a couple of meetings you're thinking god this is going to be a busy day you walk past something that's a problem and you think to yourself, okay, that's, that's a problem. I need to deal with that. But you also think in the back of your head, oh, I've got such a busy day. So you think I'll leave it or someone else will deal with it. And you, my learning is you've just got to deal with it as, as soon as you see it. And the last one was actually a bit of a battle when I was um, a little bit younger was about chit chat. I was always so focused on getting my work done. And I was always so focused on, you know, I've got a, I can't talk because when I'm talking with people, as in like socially, you know, what are you doing at the weekend, blah, 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 that's not me working. So I was always a bit um, just head down, got to get stuff done. You know, I've got to be as dedicated, I've got to be as efficient as I possibly can. And it's only probably in the last four or five years that I've realized that chit chat's okay. And actually, it's good because it builds up that relationship with somebody. And I know as a younger manager, I struggled with that because I was just so kind of like, no, you've got to be this, you've got to be that, you've got to, you know, you've got to really focus. And I used to see people talking by the water cooler and be like, oh, they're such time wasters. But, but now I understand, I get it now. It's about building relationships and there's a balance, but you'll bet your bottom dollar that if you built a relationship with them, when it hits the fan, they'll be there for you because they know you a bit better. So that, that's kind of my, my own little learning. Okay, so changing it up a little bit away from the why, um, and I think we're doing good for time, so we should be okay for some questions afterwards. Um, it's another video, and uh, it's another book, um, and I would recommend reading this one, which is um, Turn the Ship Around by um, David Marquette. I think that's how we pronounce it, David Marquette. So David Marquette was a great example of, I think, what a lot of us do. So he was a submarine captain in, in the Navy in America, and uh, you get allocated a, a certain ship. So he was allocated six months in advance that he was gonna be going to run this certain ship. 
and um, he spent six months, like we all do when we know we're moving on and we're going to another job, he spent six months planning, looking at the ship, understanding its engines, uh, analyzing the staff, like he had it ready. He went onto the ship, oh no, he about two weeks before, I think, before he was about to go on the ship, they changed his ship and they turned him to a different one called the Santa Fe. So he had to go on board a ship. He had no knowledge on it, no understanding. It was an older ship and his team were, they were at the bottom of the leaderboard. They were, they were like, I'm just going to do a football reference, but I don't want to lose friends, but they were not, they were not good. They were at the bottom of the league. And this video just gives you an insight of what, what he did and, and how he turned it around. So let's share screen. I was trained for one submarine, my guys were trained to do what they were told. That's a deadly combination. We all know organizations where, where people just follow the leader into disastrous situations. So I got my guys together and I said, hey, we've got a problem here. I was trained for another submarine, you're trained to do whatever nonsense comes out of my mouth. That's right, Captain. I mean, they knew, they already knew. I was pretty much talking to myself. So I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, guys? And we talked about it. Okay, what I really wanted to do was get ready for the inspection. But we were sitting in the wardroom. We spent a couple hours. We were talking about it. And we came up with all these different things. And, well, you Captain, you just got to be smarter. You got to give better orders. It's like, well, how am I going to learn a whole nuclear summary, miles of vials and pipes? I spent a year learning Olympia, two weeks over here. How's, I mean, so, okay, so in a year we'll be safe? That's not going to work. We had to deploy the submarine in six months. Um, so we talked about it and they said, okay, there's only one logical solution. We figured it out. You, they're pointing at me, you shut up. What do you mean? That's not what captains do. That's not what captains of nuclear submarines do. They walk around, they give orders. They sound like Russell Crowe. <laughs> Head two thirds, I make it up 500 feet. Helm left 15 degrees weather, steady course two, five, five. Load torpedoes and tubes one, two, three, and four. Slide down, open outer doors, right? <whistles> and I thought about it. And you know what? They were right. So at that point, I vowed never to give another order. And if you came down to my submarine, it'd have been very confusing because you couldn't have pointed. It would have been hard to say, well, who's, who's the captain here? Because you wouldn't have seen me giving orders. I did retain one order. The final order to launch a weapon, a torpedo or a missile, I, I kept with me because I felt that, that was, since that was going to result in the deaths of other human beings, that I didn't want that on anyone's conscience but, but mine. That was my moral and ethical responsibility. But even though everything else, in the Navy there's long lists of things that says the captain has to authorize. Captain should authorize. You got a couple nukes in your group, they'll tell you it's true. Captain authorize, submerge the ship, get underway, start up the reactor, shut down the reactor, connect to shore power, divorce from shore power, on and on, break rig for dive, on and on and on, pages of these things. I just refused to give those orders. What we replaced it with was intent. Instead of giving instructions, if you want your people to think, don't give instructions, give intent. So they would come to you, hey, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, uh, left full rotor, steady course 255. No. So well, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish here today? Well, we're trying to get in position so that when the enemy submarine comes through, okay, so where do you think we should position the ship? Uh, I don't, maybe over here. Good idea, go there. You give intent to them and they give intent to you. So my officer stopped requesting permission. And every other submarine, Captain, request permission to submerge the ship. Submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, I. On Santa Fe's, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. Very well. And they did it. 
And it might seem like it's a very small, nuanced change of language, but it was hugely powerful because the psychological ownership now shifts to them. They need to discover the answer. Otherwise, you're always the answer man. You can never go home and eat dinner. And so we started doing this. And it was hugely powerful. I actually went another step. Then I got smarter and I said, when the, when the officer said, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship, I, I would ask him, well, is it, what do you think I'm thinking right now? And he'd look at me, uh, hard to tell. I'm guessing you're wondering whether it's safe. Bingo! I said, well, convince me it's safe. He said, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. All men are below. Hatches are shut. Ship's rigged for dive. I check the bottom deck. Ship is, the submarine's in the water that's been assigned to us. Then, I was, then later I would ask them, is it the right thing to do? And they would say, well, yes, sir, because our mission requires that we... And these are the two pillars that I think support this idea of giving control. These are the two pillars that need to be in place. The, the technical competence, which is represented by, is it safe? And the organizational clarity, which is represented by, is it the right thing to do? And you put those things in place, and then you can give control, and you give control, and you put those things in place. And you are off to the races. So think about what's happening now. My officers are starting to think like me, because I have to think, like, where, well, where, where should we do the ship? And so the guys below them. Now, this took, this took 24 hours to happen. It took a couple years for the full implementation, but immediately there was change. The officers started thinking like me. So pretty soon I could go in the engine room, find the engine room lower level watch who was taking logs in the lube oil pumps, and he would know what the submarine was doing. He would know whether we were up tight, close to the enemy, and it was time to stay quiet, or whether we had backed out a little bit, and this may be a good time to change filters and make a little bit of noise. A year later, we received another inspection. A year later, we received an inspection. The inspecting team gave us the highest grade they had ever seen. Not that year, not in the Pacific, ever seen. Why? I mean, this crew had a captain who was a dummy. It's because that needle moved, started moving up. And on another submarine, there was one guy in charge, one guy giving orders, one guy thinking, and 134 people doing what they're told. I don't care how smart you are. On my submarine, I got 135 thinking, active, passionate, creative, proactive, taking initiative people. It's a tidal wave. You don't stand a chance. Here's the solution. Move the authority to where the information is. You mean the software engineer can decide whether we ship the software? Yeah. You mean the client, my, my salesman, can, just, can close the deal? Well, up to $1,000, no. Yes. Whatever the price? Yes. What does it take to make that happen? Now, if you're picturing a lot of people out there doing crazy things and a bunch of arrows going in a bunch of different directions, you have the wrong picture. You, cre you create the environment so that those people are out there making decisions as if the CEO were standing right behind them. And if it's not the same decision, it's actually a better decision because they have the information. And not only will you get better speed of execution, because now you don't have this delay, what happens is those people feel like they matter because they're thinking. You engender thinking. You create the environment for thinking. The secret is nothing, is, nothing I said is hard. There's nothing hard. The only thing that's hard is you. It will feel wrong. You've been genetically and culturally programmed to take charge and make it happen. Take take control and attract followers. And what you want is to give control and create leaders. It will feel wrong and you will repeatedly, repeatedly start down this path if you so choose and then you'll be angry at yourself like I was. And you will have a failure and you'll go back to the old ways. And you will pick yourself up and you will go again. And you will go again. And by doing so, 
you will achieve the greatest thing possible. You will have achieved greatness, not because of the deeds and acts that you did, but because you set an environment where the people around you and their families and their schools and their organizations and their businesses, they've achieved greatness. That will be the greatest thing of all. Go forth and be great. Okay, sorry, I muted myself because I had a cough. Um, so yeah, so let's just post it like we did last time. Any kind of insights that you've you've got from that? That would be really good. Um, from that video. Yeah, you're right. It's about giving control, and it's one of the hardest things to do is going to be to give control. Yeah. Yeah. Empowerment. Yeah. Create trust and respect between everyone, better productivity. Yeah. I mean, when you watch something like that, it makes sense, doesn't it? The whole kind of puppet thing. Empowerment is easy when everyone knows why. Yeah. There's a really good back to what we were first talking about, but it's so hard because when he drew the gorilla, I mean, let's face it, let's be truthful with each other. You know, we, we want to be in positions of power. That's, it's an innate thing to have authority. Um, and when we get that authority, we're, you know, we're, we're desperate to, to, to keep it and to use it. Um, you know, it's always that analogy when you're, you know, the young school kid. And then when you get up to the top of up years, you're like, right, I can get my own back on the young kids coming into school. It's exactly the same in business. You, you, I know when I was, kind of middle management or junior management, I was just going, oh, you wait, wait until I get to that position. You know, I'm going to be able to do this and do that. And, and then when you get there, you kind of go, oh, it's not the way to, it's not the way forward. In actual fact, the higher up you get, the less power you should have. But that's so hard because we, we, we thrive on the authority and the control and the ability to sort of be like, you know, can I have this and can I have that? Rather than saying, well, what do you think? And that's my biggest question that I would get you all to start saying is, well, what do you think we should do? Um, because just like when you get into power, it's, it's, it's great to have the authority and the decision-making, but your staff um, get lazy and they go, I'm not gonna think because I'm just gonna go to Amy and I'm gonna ask her what solution she wants me to give and I'll just say to her, I've got a problem. And Amy will go, okay, here's the solution. And it starts the cycle. I've got a problem. I'm not going to think about it. Go to Amy. Amy feels empowered. She feels like she, oh, aren't I great? Aren't I clever? She gives the solution and the cycle carries on. But guess what happens? I come home. I speak to my partner and I go, I can't believe my staff. They're not thinking for themselves. They're not doing this. I have to do everything. I have 10 people come up to me today and ask me a simple question. Why are they not taking control? But guess whose fault that is? That's my fault. And, and you've probably all been in those situations where you're like, oh, I really wish they could think for themselves. And why do they not come up with solutions? My problem. I've created that culture because when they come to ask me a question, instead of saying, saying sit down, what, talk me through your problem. What do you think we should do? What do you think we should have to do? What do you think we should invest money in? How do you think we should solve the problem? Because that takes time and it takes energy and it actually takes brain power from me and from them. Whereas actually, I probably dealt with the situation 10 times before in a previous life. And I can just say, this is what you need to do X, Y, and Z. Now off we go because I've got 10 million emails in my inbox. So just get on with it. And, and, and then that creates a cycle. So just look to yourself when you, when you have those frustration moments. Um, let's just see what anyone else has written. Posting on a coach rather than give the answer. Yeah, that's exactly what I just said. Opportunity for all creates a productive and happy environment. It does, it does. Um, 
yeah, it, it, it is fine as long as everyone shares the same why. And and the bit that is interesting and what you just walked is the is the pillars. So you can give authority if they have the competence and the clarity. Uh, you can provide the clarity with the why and you can try and get everybody on board. But there are going to be some people you work with that just don't have the competency. Uh, and that's a whole other session on, on, on how to kind of deal with that. But you are still going to have some people that you just going to have to tell them what to do and work with them separately on, on getting better at that. Um, okay, so just uh, finishing off now. So let's um, go back to the PowerPoint slide. Um, okay, let's kind of share that. Okay, that was great. So we did that, we did that. Okay, so I think we're just going to questions now um, that, that you sent me, just a couple, and uh, I'll I'll also see if I can find the group chat um, if it's there. So um, for, for just so you know my background um, in terms of career progression, my story was um, I moved up to the Belfry, I'm a Sussex girl at heart, moved up to Birmingham to book tea times. Um, I was told the, the one really good bit of advice that um, the, my, the revenue manager gave me at the time, he said hospitality, which we're all in, um, doesn't pay very well, but if you're good, you can move up quickly. Um, and for the younger managers on the call that, that are maybe in junior positions, that, that would be my advice that I would regurgitate now. Um, you, you won't get paid uh, great, um, but you can move up pretty quickly. Um, if you have the right attitude and you, you're sort of just up for anything, then you'll be fine. Uh, so I moved from the Belfry to, to Manning's Heath into more of a sales role. Uh, the Old Course Hotel was a sales role. Golf at Goodwood was a sales role. And that's where I would say I got my break. Um, the operations manager came and went pretty quickly. And uh, I um, nervously put my hat in the ring to basically say, look, I can carry on doing the sales bit for you, but I'd also like to, to, to take over the operations side. Um, and that was a big break um, for me because... Uh, from a title point of view, um, you do need to get manager on your CV as quick as you possibly can. And that gave me that opportunity to get assistant manager on, on my uh, CV, um, which then led to, to me becoming then the director of golf at the Fairmont. I wouldn't have got that director of golf job if I hadn't been assistant manager at golf at Goodwood. Um, and then from director of golf, um, I then became chief executive of Moor Park Golf Club and I've been here for the last couple of years. Um, so uh, I'm conscious that a lot of people sent questions in, but we probably have covered them a lot in the session. So if you have any additional questions or things that you want to ask me, um, fire away now. Um, if not, I can pull up some of the questions and see if I've answered them all. Dan asked a question about uh, attributes for looking, if I was looking to hire a general manager, uh, what, what would I constitute as, as the attributes for that? Um, I think I've just covered that in, in my uh, succession, I guess, of, of my role. Uh, you've, you've got to try and get manager somehow on your, on your title, uh, whether it's a director of golf role or an operations manager. Um, you've got to try and get some sort of generic management on your CV first um, um what do i find the most it's um i tell you what i find most difficult in a proprietary club your focus is on your team and your people um and you, you understand that your role is on them in a members club you have to almost split your you shouldn't have to but you have to split your time between your people, your staff and your team, and, the, and that's a full-time job in itself. But you also have this other arm of, of the members, of the board, of the chairman, of all the other committee. So that's, that's what I probably find most difficult from private members club to a proprietary club. Um, Sam's put, uh, why is golf not more open to senior people from outside the industry? I think it will become that way. I think with qualifications, GCMA, CMA qualifications, I think that senior people that have been businessmen or women in other industries, um, I think 
I think hiring managers are becoming a lot more open to, to, to other industries. Um, Moore Park is no exception. Okay, I was always in the golf industry, but there's no way that they would have hired a 30 something year old woman to be chief executive in Moore Park 10 years ago. So I think the industry is, is, is changing on that. Um, what jobs could I, as a food and beverage manager, offer to take on in the office to get me started? Coming more of um, the financial side, you know, I suspect you probably already have a good understanding of that. Uh, your, your cost analysis, your margins, and everything like that. But but look, try and go even more into that. Um, speak, I'm assuming you've got an accounts manager or a FD or something. But um, I would try as an F&B manager to go right into the financials. Um, the other element would be the golf side of things. Uh, so the most natural thing would be to go into maybe golf, golf day event management. So maybe just say like, look, do you mind if I, I run a golf day from start to finish and, and start getting involved with, with that more in terms of the actual golfing uh, registration, scorecards, scoring, tournament management, that kind of thing. Great. Okay. Well, I'm conscious of time, and um, I think we managed to rattle through an awful lot in in that uh, 45 minutes. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass back over to Gavin just to wrap up. And um, I must admit, it's been a strange one just talking to a computer in silence, but got through it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Oh, and um, if anyone wants to email me for any questions, uh, my my email is uh, Amy Yates, which is spelled Y E A T E S at moreparkgc.co.uk. Thank you. Gavin, over to you. Yes, um, so, um, well, um, first of all, I would like to just thank Amy uh, for, for taking time out of her busy day. Um, I think um, anybody who's involved in the industry at the moment understands that um, it's, it's been a very condensed season um, and we're, we're still extremely busy with uh, golfers out there, which is great. We're, we're obviously very lucky and privileged to, to be in that position. Um, so thank you very much, Amy, uh, for, for your wonderful insights. And some of the, the videos are fantastic as well to watch and really just helps with that, with that clarity and uh, inspiring and motivating and, you know, and getting people you know, up, for, up for more and, and getting better at what they do, which is really what we're, what we're trying to do. So again, uh, if anybody wants Amy's email address, I have it, um, and you have mine, uh, gavin at gcma.org.uk. Um, by all means, uh, drop me a line. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate, we have the principles course, as Amy said, the qualifications in, in golf club management are really what, are what's gonna help you moving forward, and we can, we can do that for you. So, um, so you know, touch base with us. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll help you through, we'll guide you through that process, uh, getting you involved into the industry and getting your, your career on the right track. So we'll call it a day there. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. Um, and we'll let you know if, um, if and when we'll be doing another one of these uh, essential skills for future club manager series. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll have another excellent speaker for you. Um, so thank you very much for your time again, and uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Cheers for that.